Hello, and welcome to Moments in History. I'm Linda Shenton Matchett, author, speaker, and history geek. During my research, I often unearth intriguing and little-known facts about World War II that I love to share. Today, I'm talking about a very little-known event called the Rosenstrasse Project. Many claim that the victors are the ones who write the history books. I'm not sure how true that is, but I do know that it has been challenging to find first-person accounts and memoirs about everyday life in Germany during World War II. I recently stumbled on a book called German Voices in which Frederick Tubach interviews German men and women who came of age between 1933 and 1945. The author himself was born in San Francisco in 1930 to German immigrants. When he was three years old, his family went back to Germany. After surviving the war, he came back to the U.S. in 1949 and reclaimed his citizenship at the age of 18. Nestled among the pages is a short vignette about the Rosenstrasse Project, an event that occurred in Berlin between the end of February and the beginning of March in 1943. It's an astonishing act of resistance in the midst of heavy-handed rule by the Nazis. One scholar referred to it as a resistance of the heart, and I agree. Here's what happened. Reports vary as to the actual number of Jews in Berlin, but by early 1943, most scholars agree that there was somewhere around 10,000 people of Jewish heritage in the city. Before dawn on February 27th, the Gestapo began to arrest them. They pulled Jews from their homes and jobs, captured them off the streets, and stuffed them into trucks headed for various detention centers throughout Berlin. About 2,000 of these people were Jewish men married to Aryan women, or male children of these so-called intermarriages, called Mischlinge, or mixed blood. They were transported to a welfare office for the Jewish community in central Berlin on a street called Rosenstrasse. Because these Jews had German relatives, many of them highly connected, Adolf Eichmann hoped that segregating them from the others would convince family members that their loved ones were being sent to labor camps rather than the more ominous destinations in occupied Poland. However, before that could happen, news of the surprise arrest pulsed through the city. Wives and other relatives appeared at the Rosenstrasse address first in ones and twos, and then in ever-growing numbers. Unarmed, unorganized, and leaderless, they faced down the most brutal forces at the disposal of the Third Reich. A chant broke out, give us our husbands back. Over the course of a week, protesters vied with the Gestapo for control of the street. Now and again, SS guards sent the women scrambling for cover with threats that they would shoot. February crept into March. The crowds grew to 150, then to 200 people. Some reports say even in the thousands. It was an unprecedented de demonstration by German citizens against Jewish incarceration. Despite the news blackout imposed by Goebel, the news of the protests on Rosenstrasse had traveled swiftly by word of mouth all over Germany and beyond. In Switzerland, British and American diplomats heard rumors of the Rosenstrasse protest, and in the first week of 1943 of March, British and American newspapers reported on the protests. Goebbels hit back by having the German newspapers claim that the women were actually protesting the British bombing of Berlin. The protesters occasionally yelled, but mostly stayed silent, watching, waiting. Without warning, the guards began set up, setting up machine guns, said Charlotte Israel, one of the protesters, in 1990. Then they directed the weapons at the crowd and shouted, if you don't go now, we are going to shoot. The movement surged backward. But then for the first time, we really hollered. Now we couldn't care less. They're going to shoot us in any case, so now we'll yell too. We yelled, murderer, murderer, murderer. That day was so cold it froze the tears on my face. Another woman later stated, we expected our husbands would return home and that they wouldn't be sent to the camps. We acted from the heart and look what happened. If you had to calculate whether you would do any good by protesting, you wouldn't have gone. 
but we acted from the heart. We wanted to show that we were not willing to let them go. What one is capable of doing when there is danger can never be repeated. I'm not a fighter by nature, only when I have to be. I did what was given to me to do. When my husband needed protection, I protected him, and there was a flood of people there. It wasn't organized. It wasn't instigated. Everyone was simply there, exactly like me. That's what was so wonderful about it. The Nazi minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, knew a massacre of hundreds of German women in the middle of Berlin would not look good. He had to be careful about what was done in public. He couldn't shoot the height of Aryan womanhood down in the middle of the street because they weren't Jewish. They didn't wear the yellow star that identified the Jews of the city. Those passing by would only see the Nazis shooting a group of women. Goebbels sent out an order and officials released the first mixed marriage Jewish man on March the 1st. The processing continued on March 12th, by which time the protesters had dispersed. Of the 2,000 detained men, 25 were sent to Auschwitz. The rest were considered exempt. However, the day after their release from Rosenstrasse, Gestapo officials returned and deported them to nearby labor camps. The plan was to ship them on to exterminate nation camps once the Germans had won the war. Interestingly, Goebbels did not try to deport the men of Rosenstrasse to Auschwitz again, saying the risk of protest was too great and instead ordered the men of Rosenstrasse to stop wearing their yellow stars of David on April 18th of 1943. Thanks for stopping by this moment in history. If you have any stories or information about the Rosenstrasse protest that you'd like to share, put them in the comments section of this video. But as always, keep it clean. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you'll never miss another one. You can find me across social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, as well as my website and blog, which is located at www.lindashentonmatchett.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Moments in History.